Hey everybody, welcome to the Fired Up with CJ show. Today we have Matt, Mike Shaw and he is talking about his book, A Story of Karma. Um, and he's going to talk all about how he um, actually probably found his own karma. Would you say that that's how you would describe it, Mike? That's uh, that's very accurate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is just a fascinating story. Um, let's start from the beginning. Let me tell us a little bit about um, the idea of the book. And I yeah. guess really it's your life story. Yeah, it's part of part of my life story anyways. Um, and, and first of all, thank you, CJ, for having me on the show. Yeah, and, and thank it's really you for great being to connect here. With you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, the journey takes place in Nepal, actually in the Nepal Himalaya. And it's a place that I had wanted to, like Nepal, I had wanted to, wanted to go to since I was um, since I was a teenager. I remember my my sister gave me this um, Lonely Planet book once for for Christmas, and it was called Trekking in the Nepal Himalaya. And I was I think I was like fourteen or fifteen years old at that time, and and I remember getting it, and I was just tearing through the pages, you know, as fast as I could without even being able to read anything, and and looking at the pictures and the you know the people and the culture and these little dotted out trekking routes with names that were foreign to me at that time and and uh, all I could think about was just running out of the house in my pajamas uh, with this lonely <laughs> planet bucket. <laughs> I'm to go I'm ready <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but um, but it wasn't actually until my early 30s that I finally was able to make it there wow. uh, because you know life as it is sometimes gets in the way and I didn't have the money back when I was a kid and and then, um, you know, and then you mean like when you're on, four, when you got the book, somebody, yeah, maybe yeah, Indiegogo wasn't available at that yes. time. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't run a campaign. Um, but, uh, but anyways, yeah. So, um, and then I was working on my career over the years and I couldn't take like a big chunk of time off like that. So yeah, it wasn't until I was uh, 32 that I finally was able to go. And, and and actually part of the reason too was I never really understood, you know, what I wanted to do. Did I want to like, I didn't want to do anything too touristy, right? I didn't want to go where everybody else was going. And and I kind of had this idea, like this over romantic idea that I wanted to go somewhere off the beaten path. And so one day, uh, this was back in 2011, um, I sat down with this uh, this friend who I met just through mutual connections and and he had been tra or trekking in the Nepal Himalaya for over 20 years. And my wife and I, my wife Chantal and I, we, we sat down with him one night and, and he was telling us all about this little valley called the Lost Valley of Narfu. And it had just been opened up at that time back in 2011. And prior to that, it had been closed off for, for years to the outside world. And so he was telling us about these, this place, he was showing us these pictures. And, and I kind of, I said to him, you know, you had me hooked at Lost Valley. <laughs> but but, um, but anyway, so that was kind of it. And I remember sitting there with Chantal and just looking at these pictures, like these are the pictures that I remember from that Lonely Planet book that my sister had given me all those years ago. And, um, and I said, you know, it was kind of like a decision in itself. I said, you know, we have to, we have to go. And Chantal kind of, we didn't even really talk about it. We just looked at each other and said, okay, we're, we're going. Mm. <laughs> and that's kind of, you know, how that was sort of the opening to the, to the reason why we went there. Yeah, was that always how you guys made decisions? Was it like an intuitive sense that you should go? Or what was it, what drove you to go to Nepal, uh, to this very specific place that you saw in a book when you were a kid? <laughs> yeah, well, I think, you know, Chantal and I, we, we, we were university sweethearts, like we met, you know, when I was, uh, when we were about 20, 21 years old. And, mm -hmm. and so we'd been together for a good decade at that point. Um, but I, I guess we kind of knew each other enough to kind of know when, I mean, she knew I was really excited about this place. And, and, and she can see when I get fired up about something. Um, and so I think she kind of knew right away that I was, that I was hooked. And, and she knows me enough to know that when I'm hooked on something, that it's going to have to let me do it. <laughs> I mean, she was excited about it too, but you know, she definitely saw kind of. But it like wasn't just your eyes. wife and Chantel. You went with your. It wasn't Chantel and yourself. You went with the crew, mm. right? Yeah, yeah. So what we decided to do, we understood from Mick that, that Mick's the guy that we sat down with. We understood from him that. Um, that now that this valley had been opened up, um, it was going to be experiencing some unprecedented change, uh, mm -hmm. kind of like you know the, the the outside world coming in, right? And 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 the people from the village too, you know, they were traveling more and more out of the village and coming back. So we kind of uh, thought, well, let's um, 
you know, let's put a little group of, of artists together and, and try and learn and observe from the people there um, and also try and capture a moment in time while it's mm. still kind of like this. And, mm. and so, because they'd been living the same way for the last 800 years, they'd been living like that. Um, so we, we Wait, had without, a, without any interaction with the outside world, like in their kind of native mm -hmm. community for 800 years. Yeah, it, it's kind of like it's a very far. I mean, it's wow. very geographically. It's it's very far removed. It's very hard to get in there. You have to trek for at that time. You had to trek for uh, for about a week just to get to this you know to this valley, and um, and then you know it's it's quite, it's quite an arduous climb. There's two main villages. They sit at about fourteen thousand feet in elevation each. Wow. So it's uh, it's kind of anyone from Seattle, I guess, would know that's like the summit of Mount Rainier where yeah. they're making their, their yeah. livelihoods, right? Um, wow. And so, uh, and, and no communication, no electricity, no cell phone, none of that, right? There's no access. They didn't even have toilets at that time when we went up there. Um, wow. So, um, yeah, so no, no communication really with the outside world even. So it's not like mm. they could just, you know, look up, oh, what's happening in the world today? Or, you know, there weren't any books. Um, they had, you know, the only thing they had in terms of reading was the scriptures in the library or in the scriptures in the uh, monasteries. So, yeah, just a totally wow. kind of cut off place right um yeah. almost like it stood still in time for for a while yeah um so we thought okay well let's get together um yeah we had a musician um you know this kind of neo hippie looking guy <laughs> we had this uh <laughs> this uh yeah he'd wear his long blonde hair and like this gold or this uh purple bandana and uh he had a, he'd have his guitar slung over his shoulder uh and then we had this um this biologist from Calgary who's kind of like this cowboy.